Man, we're doing the tag team kicks day here at the world famous Whiskey A Go Go. I appreciate I, that, guys. I am really interested to find out who were those bands, man? How did you get involved in music? You know, growing up, who really excited you to want to do this? I think it all starts with the Beatles. And anybody my age <laughs> saw the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan Show, and it changed all of our lives. All those screaming girls, Richard. Oh yeah, like that. I need that. Tear clothes off wasn't a bad deal, right? Absolutely, I need that. So that was definitely the start of it. And then you know, um, living in a little town in West Virginia, all I had was one radio station to listen to. So it was m pretty much stuff like the Monkees, um, uh, Three Dog Night, yeah. uh, um, a lot of soul music, James Brown, uh, Stevie Wonder. And then as, as I got a little older, I got into Alice Cooper, Deep Purple, Aerosmith, and then you know that then I found my niche. Yeah, yeah, it's beautiful. So now, how did the first band come about? How did you get in the garage or the basement and start making your own music? My neighbor was a guitar player. We heard each other playing from like three houses down. I played drums, he played guitar. So we decided to jam. We were about 12, 13 years old, and uh, that's the last time I ever played in my bedroom. So we put a band together about 13, 14 years old, and I've been doing it ever since. Start playing the local little... Sock hops, clubs, high schools, teen dances. towns, yep, Sunday so any, afternoons. Any, any place that would take live music, right? Exactly. When you're that age, you can't play bars, obviously, so you got to yeah. go wherever you can. Uh, swimming pools, you know, uh, uh, swimming backyards. pool dances. Yeah, backyards, parties, anything like that. Mm -hmm. Of course, we're talking with Steve Whiteman of Kicks. I don't think he introduced him. Yeah. I'm just making sure everybody knows who he is. And Absolutely. the good thing about Kicks is you guys have a great new album out. It dropped like in August of this past year. 19 years in the making, somewhat, I guess, but not really. Not right? really. No, maybe about a couple of years. I'd right? say a couple of years. People don't realize that my other band, Funny Money, put out four or five records, actually. So, you know, there's a lot of music in between when Kicks went yeah, on the hiatus. Last and the album show business was done in 95. Right. The Funny Money. Right. And it was kind of like a little bit of a continuation of Kicks, but one member didn't think so, right? Right, exactly. I mean, it, it was a continuation, but you know, it was my first opportunity to write. That was my writing vehicle, because I was really not invited to be a writer in kick. So that was my first, I was able to spread my wings and show that I could actually write songs. Now, now you bring that up for, for a second, and I wanted to touch on that, because I know your old bassist, Donnie Corral, wrote Close all the enough. music, <laughs> wrote all the music, right? Right. But I mean, how did it feel as a musician, knowing that you had like maybe a whole bunch of great songs, and did you just turn them into him and you say, I don't think so. It's not going to work. That was hard. I mean, I, I was the George Harrison, you know. Um, mm -hmm. I wrote all the time, and uh, unfortunately it didn't quite hit the standards of what he was looking for. And, uh, you know, I guess he, he, had, he had a vision for the band, and usually record company and management and everybody kind of got behind him because he was definitely a very talented songwriter. But, yeah, it was difficult, so um, I just learned to deal with it. And I was proud of the music that we made. I mean, even though he wrote the music, uh, we still had a lot of input. We still, you know, had a lot of our own characterization, our our own sounds. Like the guitar players, Ronnie and Brian, that's the kick sound. I, I, whoever writes the music, it's not going to sound like that without those Correct, two. Yeah. It's not going to sound like kicks without my voice on it, or with Jimmy playing drums. So he might have been the he might have been the writer, but you know, we through our own little little um, what do you call it? I, our nuances. <laughs> Rock and roll dust on the music. Right? Yeah, well, I mean, whatever you call that. Um, it, it wouldn't sound the same with other people doing it. Yeah, so. I mean, a lot of bands go through that. I mean, they try to replace a singer or right. a drummer, and you would think it would work, but then the fans know right away. Absolutely. It doesn't sound the same. Absolutely. Yeah, and as far as getting that initial deal, I know you guys were up in the Northeast, so you were right in around New York and all the action, yep. but tell us how hard that was to get, you know, to get Atlantic to sign you. You know, actually, it's, it, it took us by surprise because we'd, we'd been together, I'd been in the band for about three years, and our whole goal from day one, when these guys recruited me out of a little town in West Virginia, we are going to get a record deal, and, and that, that, like, that captured me right away. So I would say three years later, that's when we started to, sh to shop the material that, that Donnie had been writing and, and we had all had been writing. And we were sending live board tapes out because all the demos that we were making were just getting discarded. So we thought, we're best live, so let's send out live board tapes. And that's what caught Atlantic's ear. And Atlantic flew down to a club in, in um, like Waldorf, Maryland. And we called everybody we could think of, you know, we bust loads of people. We'd make, you got to come out. Atlantic Records is here. And we wanted to impress them. And they flew us up to New York the next week, and we got it, they signed us. 
Yeah. That was the worst move we ever made in our lives. <laughs> <laughs> but being on Atlantic or getting Being stopped? on Atlantic. Uh, being on Atlantic. They, were, they had no clue what to do with us. It just seemed like Atlantic wasn't a big label to be on in, as far as the 80s rock scene. They really so weren't. I really can't think of another band that was on Atlantic. Well, because so many people compared us to ACDC. They already had an ACDC. So yeah. what, they didn't know what to do with us. And um, it showed. I mean, it took us four albums to break, and we amassed a huge debt, and it never, it never panned out for us. Okay, now, it, it, it broke with the Blow My Fuse record right. in 88. Is that because you brought Tom Werman in? I wouldn't give him that much credit. I think, I think it was just time. We had worked our asses off on the Midnight Dynamite album. Yeah. We were relentlessly out there touring, spending our own money on tour support, going to areas of the country that we'd never been before, spending all of our money that we made on the East Coast. We made tons of money on the East Coast, made nothing anywhere else. So we took that money and we, we had our own tour support. So we went from the East Coast to Chicago, to Detroit, Cincinnati, Cleveland, all the way across the country to LA and, and start playing out here for the first time. So I think that got people's attention for the first time and, and Atlantic saw a spike in sales of Midnight Dynamite. And that's when they decided, let's push this magic button. These boys have worked hard. Another thing I wanted to bring up real quick was, before we move on to the new album, I want to talk about that, obviously, is back in the day, you had that ad in Hit Parader magazine. <laughs> and I used to always see it, and it said kicks. And I go, these guys never play in New York because we were originally from New York. And then we moved out to Los Angeles. Oh, we played in New York all the time, Lemoore's and... But I was like from New Jersey. I wasn't old enough to go to New York. Oh, okay, at the time. okay. And by the time you guys were probably playing there in '81, '82, I was already on the West Coast. Right. So I'm like, always oh, see this ad in the hit parade. Like, yeah. Hey, so who is this band? What is this band? It's a black and white ad. It was in every single issue. Yep. And I was just like, well, I know who Kicks is. I just never really heard their music yet. Was so. it in Circus too? It was in Circus. It was in Circus. Yeah. Circus. yeah. I think it was in Circus or yeah. Hit Parade or one of the two. That was another thing Atlantic noticed. And they, they saw that how, how good we were at self-promoting because yeah, exactly. they, did, they did shit. They did absolutely nothing. And we had amassed such a nice following from North Carolina to Boston because we played relentlessly up the East, up the east Coast. And uh, we would sell 80 to 100,000 records, which would make them a lot of money, but not enough to make us any money. So they would definitely you know, take our option for a new record because they made a shit ton of money off of us. We made shit. <laughs> No, I got a question for sure. you, because I had the opportunity to see you back in the 80s. Okay. And you're one of my, what I would call, Desert Island, guilty pleasure favorite band coming out of the 80s. Nice. And one of the things that a lot of people used to say about the band was you seemed a little bit out of sync or a little bit out of phase with what was actually going on. I agree seemed, with that. You seemed just a little bit different. And you opened up for a lot of great bands, Tesla, Great White, Rat. You opened up and you played with a lot of great bands. Mm -hmm. But 19 years later, after your, your last album, how does it feel to be putting out a brand new album and, and touring again and getting the recognition I feel you guys deserve because you guys are getting nice attendance figures and people are coming out to your shows and they seem to be excited to see you guys. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's surprising. I mean, when we, when we decided to go back and do some reunion shows in like 2003, 2004, in the meantime, Funny Money was all that I did, and that was, that was, that was my life. That I was sinking all my time and effort into that. And a local promoter just threw an offer on the table. He said, can, can you get Brian and Ronnie to come in? Because Funny Money already had Jimmy and Mark in it. And they said, we can get these guys to come in and let's see what happens. And the crowds were overwhelming. So we just kept it to a regional thing for a couple of years, and then we got a call from Sullivan Big from Big Time Entertainment and Sullivan had me on the phone for days saying I can book this band I can get you guys out there and I, I was you know I'm like yeah right go ahead and he got us Rocklahoma and Rocklahoma opened my eyes wide open because it was like 20,000 screaming fans and and that's what sort of got the ball rolling so he, we we hired Sullivan to be our agent and and little by little we were playing more festivals playing more casinos flying all over the country and it evolved in, into what it is um, never saw it coming never could have predicted it uh, but we're just riding the wave and enjoying it well, one of the things that we've always talked about on our show is there's a lot of bands that come up today and even a lot of bands in the past that don't have that stage presence don't bring the audience into what it is that they're listening to. Mm -hmm. And I will say this, having seen you guys, I mean, you guys pretty much blew off the stage anybody else that you guys were playing for. And what you guys are able to do as far as getting the crowd in there and getting the, the crowd into the music, I mean, is that something that is natural for you guys or is that something that you guys had to work at? That's a very conscious effort. Very conscious effort. I mean, nobody's that good that you can just go out there and wing it, you know? So we used to videotape our shows every single night. And by doing that, you learn so much 
about what looks good, what looks bad. So it's through all that experience of playing and watching all those videos. I mean, we did it for years at, at Donnie's insistence, you know. I mean, we would critique lights, we critique sound, we critique each other. And through that, we learned a lot. We learned what was cool and what was stupid. And I think that's what kind of built us and molded us into what we are now. Like a sports team, watching the films. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's the first time I've ever heard a, a musician ever say they videotaped all their early shows to learn from it. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and back and in the day, there wasn't like video cameras like we have now. Those big old clunkers, you know, exactly. big, we carried that thing around. Tape, yeah, exactly. And, and we, we would we would watch it in the bus or in the van every single night after the show. You guys were asking each other, going, what were you doing there? What's going on there? Well, we would pick out the cool things. Yeah. Oh, that's new. That's cool. We should keep that in the show. Or that yeah. was stupid. Don't do that anymore. <laughs> and don't say that. That's dumb. So um, <laughs> you, you learn. You learn what to do and what not to do. Are you still uh, keeping that dynamite stick for a microphone? Or you Every once in a while, I, I'll just pull out the sparkler. You know, okay. I'll just put the sparkler in my hand, and it's cheesy as hell. That kicks was always about cheese. I mean, we never really took ourselves all that serious. We never really, we were never those fist pumping kind of guys. We, we, we don't try to out cool the audience. We're just trying to make them have a good time. We're up there having a good time. Let's bring the audience in and, and make them part of it. That's always been our philosophy. Talk Let's make them about, laugh. Let's make them laugh. Talk a little bit about Don't Close Your Eyes. I mean, obviously a major breakthrough for you, MTV and all that. What's your greatest memory of that, and what did that help the band do? That got us on the charts. That got us into arenas. I mean, we were in arenas with Rat and, and um, Tesla. I guess it was, uh, Tesla and Great White was, yeah, that was before Don't Close Your Eyes. Mm -hmm. um, with, with Cold Blood and Blow My Fuse, that, and that album, you know, the big push was on from Atlantic Records parts of the country that had never heard of us were playing us on radio finally. So that's what got us into the arenas opening. And then Don't Close Your Eyes is what pushed it over the top and made it platinum. Um, and, that's, and that's when we thought, okay, you know, we're, we're, on, we're on board now. And then, then Nirvana showed up. <laughs> and it was flush. The party was over. But yeah, it really was. When Guns N' Roses showed up, that was the end of the party too. I think. Yeah, but you know what? Guns N' Roses could have saved it. Had they not turned into, into what they did, I, I mean, totally agree with they you. could have I mean, saved it because they brought rock and roll back and that, you know, we were in that same genre as them and everybody loved them and respected them and for some reason they fucked it all up yeah. and it's a shame because they really could have saved I it. I would say one guy did. Yeah, we all know now, but, yeah. but you know, back then the, the double album, it just didn't make any sense and then you just heard the stories and the fighting and the drugs and it just, and it yeah. just died. Going on late every night. And yeah, yeah, and making the crowds wait for hours, and uh, yeah, they, they killed themselves, and, and they also flushed this genre with them because of all the Seattle stuff that was getting popular. Right, I don't blame them for the, death, for the death of our genre of music, yeah. but they definitely had a, had a part in it. They could, have been, they could have been a bigger part in saving it. All right, well, you guys, so you have a brand new album out, Rock Your Face Off, and uh, you mentioned this previously. You had the uh, four or five albums with Funny Money. Uh -huh. and great albums, I got them all. Thank you. And uh, I will say this, I noticed, like you said earlier, that you're doing a lot more writing. You were doing a lot more writing. So in a way, I guess I'll ask this because you were able to get the four members back into the band. Right. And was a lot of this material already pre-written maybe for another Funny Money album or was this the intention all along to just release a new Kicks album? We released a live DVD CD in, in 2012 on Frontiers Records. And they put a bug on our saying they would love to have a new album, a new studio album from Kicks, And that's what got, got us um, kind of churning, you know, it got, got everybody's juices flowing. I was writing for a new Funny Money CD, Mark was writing, and we just stopped right there and we thought, okay, anything that's get written now and anything that's good from what we've already written, let's gear it towards that idea for a new Kicks album. And the Frontiers thing didn't work out and luckily we were, we were able to reach Loud and Proud Records because we'd had a history with Tom. Tom Lipsky through the last uh, Kicks album, Show Business. Tom was the head of CMC Records. So having Tom on board and being with Loud and Proud, it just made sense. And we all got gung-ho about it. Then we got serious about it. And we just kept writing and writing. And we got Taylor Rhodes involved. And I Taylor. That as well. He wrote a lot of the, the classic songs. Yep. The guys the having somebody guys. that knew and understood the band's vision and, and what we were about was, was really vital, I think, in keeping us true to our sound and what he felt the fans would expect. Yeah, that's what I heard, too, in the interview that I believe one of your guitar players, Brian, mentioned that you have all this material, but you kind of needed somebody that wasn't in the band that worked with the band right. to bring it back and give it that kick Right, sound. because, because I, I think we would have picked different songs had Taylor not been involved. Some we, songs were heavier, some right. songs weren't as right. heavy. Right, we were right. We let him pick them. We threw it all into a pile and we said, you pick them. And, and, and we trust you. Now, would you say this is pre-Kicks? 
from a band's perspective, a true kicks album being that every member in the band. It was the most liberating album we've ever done because everybody got to contribute. When we, we all sat in the same room and we were able to speak up and go, I don't like that part, or well, I can make that better, or that lyric's stupid, and anybody could say that. We could never do that before. It was like whatever was put before us was stone. And this was the first time we were able to actually contribute and collaborate together. So it was liberating as hell. And we think we made a good Kicks album. I mean, the, the fans seem to, to think, yeah, that sounds like Kicks to me. Well, it sounds like Kicks, but it doesn't sound like 1988, 1999. Thank God. It, it's, it's, it does. It's got a modern sound, which you guys are afraid of adapting to, but it's still there. It doesn't sound like I'm 20 years ago when this came out. Right, right. I mean, Kicks always had diverse music, too. I mean, we could, we could do a song like Heartache, or we could do Walking Away, and then we could do Mighty Mouth, and we could do uh, Rock and Roll Overdose. We could, we could go from, from side to side, and, and our fans still liked it. All right. Going back now, that, now that you have the Kicks albums, the Funny Money albums, mm -hmm. is there a favorite that if you had to pick one of these albums that you were going to take and say, you know what, this is the album I'm probably the most proud of, or maybe a track or two that you're most proud of that, uh, that you're, I guess, Got your staple all over. There's got to be two. I mean, for Kicks, it's got to be Blow My Fuse because that's the one that finally uh, got us the attention that we, we really deserved. And uh, the, the music on that record was great. Um, that was just the best memory of our lives because it got, us, it got us to Japan, it got us to the UK, it got us touring the country over and over again. And for me, the, the Funny Money CD, Stick It. Well, I think it's a great CD. I think, and, and the Bo Hill, who, who mixed that, said, you guys should call this Kicks and put it out there. And I wouldn't do it, because it wasn't Kicks. But he, he loved the record, and so did I. And to me, I'm most proud of that record than anything. So that, and I will say this, I mean, I've, I've had a chance to listen to all those albums, and, and just the songwriting in and of itself, it could have been a Kicks album. Yeah. And, and I think you did exactly what you wanted to do. You brought in the right producer, and, yep. and you guys reestablished the sound that you're known for. So. I mean, right now, 2015, we've got new kicks, and I'm looking forward to it. I'm Me too. To see what else you guys are going to come out with. Me too. So you got a favorite song off the new album? I mean, I know you just put a video out for Wheels, Wheels in, in Motion, Motion, which is a great video. That's always been, that was like one of my favorites from the get-go. That was one of the first songs that I heard that Mark was, was introducing. Interesting lyrics, to say the least. Yeah, yeah. I, I, really like, I really like that one, and I love Can't Stop the Show. Can't Stop I the Show. I think that's just, that says it all. I'm kind of like interested in Inside Outside In. That's kind of an interesting song too. That was just, I mean, I was writing for Funny Money at the time and uh -huh. I wrote from the heart. I mean, that's about me and my, my family and you know, that's how falling in love with my wife 31 years ago and we're still together, two kids later and, yeah. and I just wrote from the heart. The story behind the song, now we know. Yeah. I know you guys are headlining M3. Congratulations. Big yeah, we do that every out. year. That's our backyard. That's easy. <laughs> sure. But with Rocklahoma and all that, you know, obviously there's a nostalgic part of it. But, you know, all the fans, they miss that straight ahead rock and roll. When you play these events, what, what, what is the feeling that you get when you see people celebrate? Overwhelming music? joy. Just, I mean, just, just hair-raising chills when you get out in front of 20,000 people and they're on their feet and they're clapping and they're, they're digging your shit and they laugh at all your jokes and, and they cheer and they sing along with every song. I mean, what can be better than that? Yeah. That's, uh, that's what big bands, you know, like Aerosmith and the Stones, they experience that every night. We experience it once in a while, but man, when you get it, I'm getting chills now just thinking about it. Yeah. So I was just going to say, it's kind of a, a case where as time goes on a little bit, people miss, they miss that part of their life where it was maybe easier, it was a different time, and it's a celebration of youth. And as true. you know, in a rock and roll band, you really never grow old. That's absolutely true. Yeah. So with the M3 show, and then obviously you're doing the Monsters of Rock again, mm -hmm. it's like one big party too. Right. Do you, do you find it to be like more nostalgic, or do you find there's a lot of younger fans coming to check out Kicks? I think it's more nostalgic, but yeah, we get a lot of younger fans checking it out because their parents are turning them on to it, and their parents Which, are saying, this yeah. band's great, listen to them. Exactly. And if the kids give it a chance, this they, they tend to like it. one of their songs. Yeah. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> So, I mean, we, uh, yeah, our crowds are becoming multi-generational now. It'll be moms with kids and sometimes grandmas with, with moms and kids. So I, that shows your age right there. And I think a lot of people, like you mentioned, want to go to these big festivals. They want to see all these bands in, in a couple of days, and they just figure, hey, you know what? We worked our lives. We raised our kids. Let's go party for them. Yeah, thank God. Weekend, thank yeah. God for the resurgence and, and, and the people opening up their minds to go, this music was good, and, and it's cool again, so let's go enjoy it. It was entertaining. 
Yeah. yeah. Was entertaining. Like, you, like you said, Kix isn't about um, world politics and all this stuff. It's about leaving all that behind for a yep. couple of hours, coming to a show, being entertained, and then yep. saying, hey, you know what, I had a great time. Great memory. Yep, yep. Leave your problems at the door, come in, have a good time, then pick them up on your way out. You know, they say ACDC keeps making the same album, but it was a hell of an album. It's a great album, isn't that, it? That music, <laughs> man, that's on, you know. Now, what advice do you give to those young bands, young creative people? Because the industry's changed completely. Absolutely. You don't have the Tower Records, don't have the, the Geffen Records and all these You don't even anymore. have record companies but anymore. What advice do you give them to kind of chart their own course or find their own voice which is more important than getting a deal wow before. you know I, I i wish i had the, the perfect answer for that because if we knew the answer to that we would be, we would be implementing it on this new album i mean kids don't buy physical product anymore it's all downloads and as the day after our album was released my kids showed me on pirate bay there's your record it's free so people just download it. I mean, if people can get it for nothing, they're, going to, they're, they're not going to pay for it. So the new product is just, just to let people know that you, you have written a new album, and now hopefully enough of them will have heard it that you can go out and play it in front of people. So the, the day in, of, of selling a lot of CDs, when we entered the charts, the Billboard charts at number 49, we sold 5,000 CDs. Now that's piss. You know, and from 20 year ago standards. So that just goes to show the, the where the where the business is. I wouldn't have a clue as to what to tell kids. Kids know more than I do now. But I mean, they start playing covers. What do you do to encourage them to find their own style to write originals? Well, I always do that. I mean, but I do encourage younger people to learn covers because that that's where you get all your influences from. That's what I did. I did it from the time I was 13 till I was 25. We played cover songs and kicks on our third album. We were still out on our third album playing cover songs. And that just gave, gave us a huge library of influences and that just kept us, you know, kept our juices flowing and, and writing different, better songs. So I encourage them to do both. Do the covers, but write your own stuff too. Yeah, so take chances, kind of don't follow, find something that's unique about you. Yeah, I always encourage them, don't just be, a, don't be just a, an original band because people don't want to come out and see original bands. They want to hear something that they recognize and slip your original music in there, you know, trick them. And then after they like it, go, that's one of ours. So, exactly, a lot of bands are doing it now. Play the covers, yeah. put a couple of originals in there. Yep. Because they're already there to see the, the covers. Exactly. People want to, they want to recognize the music. And if you play a whole bunch of shit they've never heard before, you're going to lose them. It's like if you play the whole new album tonight, people are going to go, what the? We're playing five new ones tonight, and that's that's, that's daring. Me. That's great with me. So let's talk about the album cover real quick. Um, explain that to me real quick. I have no idea. No idea. I have nothing to do with that. <laughs> Want to film that real quick? Uh, well, um, I don't know. How do you explain that? I mean, I it's, it, it's obviously it's, a bomb. Yeah, it's rock your face off. So the I, the idea is that yeah. kicks is the bomb. The bomb goes off with the with the music, and the music just blows your face off. This one guy's holding his ears. It's like that's really gonna help. I know. I, w I was I was not really uh, supportive of the of the the name of the album. I mean, when we, they decided that was what was going to be, I'm like, mm, that's not my favorite, not my not what I would choose to call the record. But right, everybody well, was on board. Change? I would have chose "Don't Stop the Show." Don't stop. That, yeah. That to me sounds a little bit more. I don't know. Rock your face off. Do I really want my face rocked off? No, I want to rock from that. Well, it, it also came from the song, and, yeah. and we, we were even on defense of, of that as a title for a song. We just thought, that's, that's kind of, you know, kind of childish sounding. But everybody liked it, and the record company liked it, and when the head of the record company tells you, no, that's what it is, well, that's what it is. Yeah. But, you want to keep them excited. Yeah, you but know? I mean, you know, the, the album title doesn't matter. It's what's on the album that matters. So as long as people give it a chance and don't worry, don't judge it by by its cover. <laughs> well, you know, it's the songs that we remember. Exactly. When this music comes out, what do we remember 20, 30 years ago? It's the songs. Exactly. Yeah, you don't remember album covers. You don't remember al album titles. You remember what was yeah. on the album. Especially with iTunes, because you can just buy that song. Yeah, exactly. You still doing vocal lessons? I am. Yeah. You get a lot of clients? I do. So I'm, what, do you, what do you tell these young vocalists? What, what are they uh, not the, doing right or doing right? Well, it depends on everybody's different. Yeah. Some of them are that aren't good. And some of them really have a lot of potential. And the ones that have potential, I really work, work diligently with them. Those who don't have a chance, I just go through the motions. Mm -hmm. They're just there to, you know, for their own ego, and I'll, right. I'll take their money. <laughs> hey, why not? <laughs> Got anything like that now? Yeah, one of the questions we like to ask our guests on our show, Spinal Tap Moment. Oh, you are in the Christ. Industry, so. I could write a book. Are you kidding? Okay, well, here we go. You got, you got one moment that this really stands out. Oh, yeah, actually, the night we, the first time we saw 
uh, Spinal Tap, we were playing Brooklyn Lemoore's. And, you know, you don't go on to like 3 in the morning in Brooklyn, so you got to go kill some time. And we decided to go see the movie Spinal Tap. So we're in there watching, and we were all looking at each other, going, man, we should never have come to see this on the night we got to play, because it was all so true. I mean, everything that they went through, we all lived all that shit. And then when we came out, it was raining to beat the band, and we got in the, in the van, the van had a flat tire. And we had to go out there and change a flat fucking tire <laughs> and pouring down rain on our way to a show Brooklyn. that we didn't want to do anymore because we just saw Spinal Tap. <laughs> wow. No, I got so many of those stories. I mean, man, promoters pulling guns and all kinds of shit. It's, oh, we'll have to tap you for another interview. Yeah. Those stories. Yeah. That's why you got to have a sense of humor about it. You roll Absolutely. With, roll with the changes Absolutely. and make the most out of what you got. Absolutely. If you don't have a sense of humor, you can't be in a band. No. All right, one last question. Okay. Okay, there's going to be a lot. There's going to be two last questions. Okay, two last questions, but uh, I'll ask you this. If people are going to go see you guys in concert, I've seen you guys before. Mm -hmm. What can they expect from a kick show right now? What are they going to get seeing you guys live on stage? A visual band. Uh, a lot of energy. Um, hopefully, I'll come up with some funny stuff that's going to, you know, make them laugh. And, and like I say, forget about your problems. Come in and have some fun. Um, we, we don't preach. We don't do anything but just play high energy rock and roll and just try to have a great time. It, it's, I hate to say we're a party band because I think we're more than that. We're, we're, we're just, um, we're very serious about what we do and our presentation is very well thought out and everybody, everybody works really hard at being the best they can be, staying in good shape, taking care of themselves and when we hit that stage it's, it's really important that we put on a good show. As far as the specialness of being here at the Whiskey A Go-Go, obviously everybody from Hendrix to Zeppelin, mm -hmm. from the who to you know to that guy Judas Priest yeah they've <laughs> all you know Van Halen Motley Crue they've all played here yeah so what 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 specialness do you have just being one you know uh, another nail in in this wall here of all the legendary it, I don't look at it I don't look at the room I look at the people I mean the, the room is just a shell it, it's the people that fill it up Rich. that yeah it, it, the tonight's show is totally different from any other show that's ever been here so I don't worry about the, the, the legend of the building. I worry about the crowd that's going to show up and give them the best show possible. Yeah, and L.A.'s always been a good crowd. L.A.'s right? always been great to us. That's why we're back. Yeah. I just wanted to do a quick word association with you. I mean, you All right, quickly, because I hear my I, sound check exactly. music coming on. Auto-tune. Fuck auto-tune. <laughs> Molly Crew. Um, you know, I didn't appreciate Motley Crew until after Kix uh, broke up. Um, I, I felt they were overrated, to be honest. I didn't think that, that they were that much better than we were, but they blew our doors off as far as sales and you know, popularity. But as I listened to them more and more, I've really learned to appreciate what they did and what they were about. So it took me a while to, to grasp what they were about. Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Fuck, no chance. <laughs> Just in general? Oh, in general, I think it's horse shit. I mean, it, it's, it's, it doesn't matter. Eddie Trunk? Love Eddie. And Headbangers Ball? Old MTV show that you great times, also. great times. Had some, had some very funny moments on there that people, in fact, the last time we I were still on. I remember you guys being the host. Out of all the musicians yeah. that were hosts, I always remember. Because we were funny. Exactly. We got people's attention. That's what I try to do when I get in front of people is make an impression. Don't just go up there and go through the motions and, you know, be like everybody else. Be, yeah. be yourself. I'm a funny guy, so use that shit on stage.